So now we're going to do uh, the focus on and some of the conversations was toward uh, this session, uh, intermodal transportation and freight carrier. Uh, we have uh, uh, representing Detroit metro area, followed by uh, Derek Smith, and we're going to switch the order and have Derek Smith to go first, vice president of CSX for uh, emerging markets since he may have to leave. Uh, leave us, and then we'll hear from LaDonna, how do you pronounce the last name, I don't want to botch it up, DiCamello, who's the Director of Government Affairs for BNSF Railway Company. First, Derek. Thank you, Mayor Brown. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to be uh, invited to today's session and be part of this dialogue, and uh, I guess one of the benefits of being able to be asked to speak at this time is, is that much of the groundwork has been laid by some of the previous speakers. Uh, and I guess one of the challenges, of course, is, is that to try to be fresh and not be redundant in going through some of my remarks. So I will certainly uh, endeavor to do that. But I do appreciate the consideration in terms of reversing, reversing your order. Um, you know, one of the things that's really exciting about talking about uh, this subject today is the fact that we can now look forward. The worst is behind us in terms of our estimation in terms of what's going on in the economy. And so now we can talk about growth, hopefully sustained growth, and how do cities such as the ones that the mayors that are represented around this table uh, are part of, and certainly the various court officials as well, how do they participate in that growth is very, very important. At CSX, of course, we serve the eastern half of the United States, uh, so I apologize to our visitors from the western half of the country if I sound like I have kind of an east coast bias. I really do not because we do participate in uh, traffic that comes over the west coast, working with partners such as the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway uh, and others in terms of bringing goods uh, into the east coast where they're consumed. But what we see is that uh, as the economy improves, as you've already heard, so will both imports and exports. And I know a lot of the discussion today and in this conference is going to be around containerized freight, but I'd be remiss if we didn't take the opportunity to talk about all freight. Because really there's a great opportunity here to talk about break bulk, so whether you're talking about paper, as I believe Mayor Foster had, uh, had spoke of, uh, if you're talking about steel products, certainly bulk products, which is agricultural products, on the bulk side, for us, we're seeing uh, tremendous growth in export metallurgical coal that's going to some of those developing countries through ports such as Baltimore, Newport News, and others as well. Also automobiles, construction equipment. You'd be amazed to hear the stories of companies like John Deere and Caterpillar express in terms of the growth that they're looking at in, in being able to export their products that are manufactured in the United States worldwide and it's pretty exciting. So the capabilities that you need to be thinking about, I believe, uh, in terms of ports, clearly on the container side, there's absolutely no question. But we really do need to have a conversation that goes more broadly about the capabilities of being able to handle uh, other commodities as well. Now, what are some of the major factors um, that determine where the freight goes and how ports are actually able to capture share? Well, first of all, it's in terms of market reach. Uh, you've heard some today, and you certainly have a lot of statistics that are in this book from IHS uh, Global Insight that talk about you know, some of the uh, major metro areas that are in this country. So whether you're talking about a local or regional market, whether it is the uh, Southern California Basin, or it's New York, New Jersey, or here in the Southeast, the ability to be able to reach that freight uh, effectively and competitively. And then, where you're seeing a lot of focus is in, in terms of trying to reach some of those distant markets. So you talk about Chicago in trying to get to the Midwest. Is it efficient in getting to it from the West Coast as it traditionally has been? How much of the Midwest would be able to be uh, reached from East Coast ports? A huge, huge question, but it certainly is a clear, uh, uh, clear issue to be talked about. Port infrastructure, I probably don't really need to say a whole lot more on that. Uh, but certainly the key items here in terms of water depth, as you've already talked about, and in fact John Martin had shared saying, hey, it takes 50 feet to be in the game, believe it or not. When you talk about road and rail access, 
Uh, the ability of getting through the port is one matter, getting to and from the port is another matter. And where is the funding and the support coming from for that? Also, warehouse and distribution facilities. You know, that paper that comes in or those boxes that come in to these various ports, oftentimes they have to be broken down and then, then put into different shipments to get to their ultimate destination. So the ability to track warehousing and distribution facilities. I believe one of the speakers this morning spoke about some of the growth that Savannah has seen has been because they have made, they've been able to attract those types of investments and really build the critical mass there. And guess what? That does create jobs, and guess what? Those jobs tend not to move away too quickly. They tend to be a permanent part of your economy. And then, of course, in terms of competitive handling. In this aspect, we talk about bulk storage. So having the ability of having a storage pad for commodities like export coal or salt or grain, such as with silos and so forth, is very, very important. The ability to be able to have staging areas for automobiles as they come in over the ports, such as they have here in Jacksonville and other ports. And also in terms of, of course, being able to handle the intermodal containers through the intermodal container transfer facilities that are on or near dock and have direct rail access really helps in terms of being more competitive. Very briefly, I'll touch on a few things that uh, we see that uh, we're actively working on. Uh, our company has spent $175 million in capital uh, in a community called North, North Baltimore. We refer to it more broadly as Northwest Ohio with state-of-the-art equipment for handling intermodal containers. While this particular map uh, demonstrates arrows with the ability of being able to draw traffic from the East Coast, today it is handling traffic from the West Coast as well, getting to Midwestern and secondary markets. You might think of uh, our Northwest Ohio as being somewhat of a mixing center uh, in order to be able to handle and process freight and in fact do so more efficiently because we're able to bypass a lot of bottlenecks that traditionally have bogged down places like Chicago. Uh, in partnership with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, who's had an interest in terms of expanding their commuter operation, which, oh, by the way, goes on our freight system, uh, we have worked in a, in a uh, partnership with them where they have been able to uh, ex expand clearances and allow us to now handle double stack containers, which is certainly a far more economic and efficient way of handling uh, containers across the, uh, across the Commonwealth. And then our, one of our major uh, federal and state uh, public-private partnerships is an $850 million project. We talk about the National Gateway, which really enhances access from ports such as Baltimore, Wilmington, and Norfolk going into places such as Northwest Ohio. In the southeast, um, you know, we're working with uh, many of the ports, uh, such as the port here in Jacksonville, in terms of being able to increase the efficiency of rail and in help in turn increase the throughput through these ports as well. I should say, oh, by the way, we have access uh, to over 70 ports along the uh, eastern seaboard and into the Gulf, also including some inland ports. So this does give us, I think, a very unique perspective on the capabilities of various port facilities and ways in which we can help be more efficient to help your ports be more effective. Savannah was already mentioned as being the fastest growing container port uh, in the United States. Uh, and clearly one of the uh, things that they would cite, not us, is the fact that they have on dock rail for both railroads that come into that port, both CSX as well as our eastern competitor, the Norfolk Southern. And Charleston, of course, is looking to grow their volumes greater uh, there as well. And they're very focused in terms of finding ways in terms of developing more direct rail access. But here in Jacksonville, thanks to the leadership of Mayor Brown, uh, Chief Executive Officer Paul Anderson for Jacksport, uh, they were very instrumental in leading a coalition between uh, the private sector as well as the public sector here in terms of a $30 million investment to construct an on-docked intermodal container transfer facility at an area that you see on the map highlighted that's referred to as Dames Point, uh, which some of you may have passed by coming into town. Uh, through the mayor's leadership and Mr. Anderson's leadership, we were able to get four, uh, $20 million from the state and then another $10 million through the most recent uh, Tiger Grant uh, uh, process as well. This really represented a uh, partnership between Jacksport, the city of Jacksonville, and also Florida DOT 
our company helped provide design and engineering expertise and of course as we are working very, very closely to make sure that as this project matures that we're able to connect to it uh, very efficiently and meet the expectations. It will improve connections to southeastern as well as Midwest markets uh, over our railroad with a targeted completion of 2014. So we're hoping, as Paul said, that we can move through these, these process with the federal agencies in a very expeditious mm -hmm. manner. So finally, you know, these investments in U.S. ports will continue. Uh, you know, when you hear about some of the numbers that uh, many of these ports are spending every day, it's really staggering. But on the other hand, it's very gratifying and frankly overdue. And the ability to be able to attract more dollars is going to be important. So what's really driving this? Well, it's several factors. All of us as consumers have an insatiable demand for a lot of, uh, you know, particular consumer products. And so that's going to drive the need for more imports coming through these various ports. We talked about the uh, completion of the Panama Canal uh, expansion being very critical, but also routing the cargo through um, uh, the Suez Canal from Southeast Asia. And I certainly appreciate John's comments there, and he had a lot of facts and figures that would invite you to pour over to see the real impact that it will have here, particularly on East Coast ports. But this increased competition for what's referred to as discretionary cargo. So think of that as the freight that's not necessarily going to just stop at where the, where, when it comes to a particular port, but it's going elsewhere. That's also fueling a lot of the development at these ports as well. And as Mayor Brown has, has often talked about, and I've been, you know, had the uh, honor of being in his presence several times when he's mentioned that, hey, the recognition of ports in terms of driving economic development is really key. So it's really fostering several actions. Um, as you'll see coming up behind me, I won't comment on all of them for the sake of time, but clearly uh, the importance of being able to deepen a lot of the channels and harbors at these particular ports is very, very critical, as well as the various uh, improvements that need to be made as far as road and rail access. And then, of course, the need to secure funding. So that's where your voice can be heard and be heard very loudly and very clearly by many that I think need to hear this message plain and simple. So we're pleased to be able to uh, participate in this. Uh, this last slide just references the fact that, uh, you know, we also know that there are concerns about environmental impacts. Uh, and so certainly as a transportation provider, uh, those of us in the rail industry, and I think I could speak for the BNSF here by saying is that, you know, we certainly are very, very focused on trying to make sure that we are uh, environmentally compatible as well. You've often heard the tagline of which it's now up to, you can move a ton of freight almost 500 miles on a gallon of diesel fuel. And that certainly has been resonating in the halls of Congress. And we certainly hope that as you take that message back to your hometown and talk to the, the constituents in your, uh, in your local areas, that you will remember that as well. So Mayor Brown, thank you very much. And again, it was a pleasure being here this morning. Thank you. Now we're here from Mayor Weil. Westland, Michigan. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, first I'll announce our city is going to put in an offer on that boat that's out in front of uh, the hotel today. <laughs> My deputy mayor's been telling me we need a mobile city hall, so I, I think that pretty much fits the bill. So if, uh, if we get it, if we get it, everybody's invited tonight, okay. Um, but I'd like to say I'm here on behalf of the Detroit Metropolitan Region and the Detroit Wayne County Port Authority. And we talked a lot about seaports today, and um, I want to make sure that, that we keep uh, our Great Lakes ports uh, in the conversation as well. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kind of what they do, the importance that they play, and then I'm going to kind of throw a couple items on the table that hopefully we can uh, use as discussion items uh, throughout the conference as we uh, work towards our uh, our strategy and, and uh, moving forward. Uh, in Michigan, there's currently 38 deep water commercial ports surrounding the state, and all these ports have access both to and from the Atlantic Ocean uh, via the 2300 mile St. Lawrence Seaway, and to the Gulf of Mexico and the, Me and the Mississippi River via the Mississippi River Bar Drought. Uh, this integrated navigation system serves miners, farmers, factory workers, commercial interest uh, from the Western Plains to the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, currently, 34 states' economies are dependent on this seaway. From Great Lakes Seaports, uh, a multimodal transportation network fans out across the continent. Uh, more than 40 provincial and interstate highways 
and nearly 30 rail links link to the 15 major ports of the system and the 50 regional ports with consumers, products, and industries all over North America. Uh, the primary carriers that use this seaway are your Great Lakes bulk carriers, which they call Lakers, the ocean ships or salties, and the tug-propelled barges. Virtually every commodity imaginable moves on the Great Lakes seaway system. Annual commerce on the system exceeds 200 million net tons, and there's still ample room for growth. Uh, some commodities that are dominant, including uh, that are shipped, include iron ore, coal, limestone, asphalt, and petroleum, just to name a few. The relationship in proximity between the Great Lakes and Canada is an, plays an important role in the country's import and export future. Right now, Canada is the U.S. Canada in the United States and Canada is the largest two-way trading partner. Uh, they're our largest two-way trading partner that we have. Uh, we're, we're moving $1.5 billion worth of goods every single day. For 35 states in the United States, Canada is their largest export destination. And the Michigan border crossings handle one-third of this trade, which is over $500 million per day. The biggest problem we face is that while our proximity is ideal, our system has not been upgraded since 1959. And as the demand grows for exports, the ships keep getting bigger and, the capa and more capacity is going to be needed. Uh, actually, it already is. Uh, additionally, there's not enough water depth in our ports, and our locks are outdated and narrow. And they're unable to accommodate the larger shipping industry. Uh, right now, there's 15 total locks uh, in the seaway that I mentioned, and 13 are owned by Canada. But there are several areas that could be improved and I want to share with you today that I certainly believe can help everybody as we put this strategy together. Uh, the first thing I want to throw on the table is the adoption of the Short Sea Shipping Act of 2011. This bill, which is currently in the hands of the House Ways and Means Committee, basically eliminates the tax on commercial cargo other than bulk cargo. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that. That's the harbor maintenance tax in the fund that, that was mentioned earlier. But basically what this, what this bill does is it eliminates the, the tax on commercial cargo other than the bulk cargo. So when, when those Lakers are coming down and loaded up with, with coal or salt or uh, any of the other things they carry, we're not talking about those trips. We're talking about the, the commercial cargo because we want to, we want to uh, encourage these ships being used more. We know that, that our roads, our bridges, our highways are under distress now and the dollars aren't there to fix them, but we still have room in our seaways for extra capacity. Now what happens is that with this, the harbor maintenance tax, if you put something on a boat and you send it down, you send it over to the United States, once it gets here, if you take it off one boat and put it on another boat, you pay the harbor maintenance tax again, and so on and so on. So what we're saying is that to encourage the use of, of boats as opposed to just bringing in everything, which what's happening right now is when you bring things into Detroit, it comes off the boat and it goes on the back of a truck and then it gets shipped out. So we're saying that by eliminating that, uh, by, by adopting this bill, it'll eliminate that tax. Now the money from the tax that, that it collects, it is a good idea and it, and it does fund the Harbor Maintenance uh, Trust Fund, which was mentioned earlier and we talked about how much money that was brought into it. Now this bill, since it's eliminating future revenue, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a uh, budgetary impact. So it's gaining bipartisan support. Now we talked about the, uh, the maintenance trust fund and how much it brings in a year. Now currently there's $6 billion sitting in this fund. And I know the Army Corps of Engineers are represented here today, they could tell you what those dollars could be used for a lot better than I could. So uh, we're also asking that, that the Congress has got to stop the use of the Harbor Maintenance Act as a slush fund and use it for its purpose. Uh, if this Harbor Maintenance Trust was used as it was intended, it would help ensure that the amounts deposited uh, are used for their intended purposes, which are to maintain our nation's harbors. Let me switch over to the intermodal connectivity and freight hauling. Uh, 
Uh, one of the biggest infrastructure and economic development drivers touted by ec economists continues to be the predicted growth of freight in the United States. Even while lukewarm consumer spending has temporarily hindered import and export volumes, there is still a strong consensus within the industry that this will soon change. For example, by 2020, the U.S. trucking industry will move 3 billion more tons of freight than is hauled today. To meet this demand, the, in the industry is going to have to put another 1.8 million trucks on the road. In 40 years, overall freight demand is expected to double from 15 billion tons today to 30 billion tons by 2050. And freight carried by trucks will increase 41 percent, by rail 38 percent from today's volumes. The numbers of the trucks on the road today are expected to double. So we need to adjust to these changes. In the past, we focused on fixing problems in individual sectors instead of revamping our thinking and actually treating this infrastructure like an like a interdependent system. That sort of thinking does not in any way constitute uh, a long-term feasible solution, so we need to change that. We need to encourage the administration and our legislatures to focus on making critical investments towards improving our intermodal transportation linkages long-term. In, in the city of Detroit, uh, you can look right across the river and you can see Canada uh, in about, a th about one quarter of all the U.S.-Canada trade goes back and forth between that border crossing and it's all dependent on an 83-year-old bridge um, that, that 34 states depend on for their economy. So that's something that Michigan's taking a look at right now. They're trying to, to find a way to get another bridge across there. Um, I get all kinds of statistics here, but a lot of that stuff's already been covered today. Uh, one of the other uh, viable long-term alternatives we're looking at in Michigan to help us at this crossing uh, is a new rail tunnel as one option. So as we put together our strategy here this weekend, uh, the one thing I kind of want to hammer home is that the plan that we present to the administration must include the creation of federal legislation that allows for both the critical maintenance of the current freight system and also provides options for funding larger transportation projects that will directly benefit states and the nation as a whole. I'm hoping our lawmakers can make a clear connection between transportation infrastructure investment and our economic viability. I know the conference is doing everything they can to make sure that they do so. And uh, the, the one last thing I want to throw out it was brought up just a little bit more is kind of what's happened to this whole industry uh, post 9-11. Um, you know, businesses right now feel that that um, the enhanced security of our borders has caused long delays and represents significant and unnecessary restrictions on trade and commerce. The federal government had a legitimate reason to place a stronger focus on border security since 9-11. Nobody's debating that. But when it comes to imports and exports, the effort has been perceived by most as part of trumping trade. Uh, shippers complain they're being overwhelmed by paperwork and undergoing rigorous, rigorous searches that have them detained at the border for hours. Uh, this has caused a significant ripple effect through the supply line uh, as evidence on 9-11 when the border closed in Detroit, which started impacting auto plants in the South within just a matter of hours. So our government needs to consider allowing so-called low-risk travelers and trusted shippers to speed through quicker instead of holding everyone to the same security standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We'll have Madonna uh, present, and it'll be about three minutes, and then from there we're going to get into a discussion. I'll try to keep to three minutes. I didn't know when I was uh, creating this presentation that I would be summarizing this morning's um, discussion. So a lot of what I have has already been discussed. But really quick on BNSF, uh, we are one of two class one railroad in the West Coast. Uh, it's BNSF and Union Pacific. And because this segment was entitled freight corridors or had freight corridors in the title, um, I opted to include ours. Uh, we are a product of the merger of the Burlington Northern and the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe, so we cover the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest. Uh, we are the, the largest rail intermodal carrier in the U.S., and that is largely, of course, because the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. 
<clears throat> Summarizing the problem, and this is really what I wanted to talk about, but what has been discussed today, you all know the supply chain is key to our economy. It has helped us grow immensely over the last several years, $1.4 trillion in goods and economic activity, 8 million jobs. Uh, it is the key to our competitiveness. But here is the problem, and this has already been stated as well. The big build-out has passed. Um, the railroads were built at the turn of the century. The highways were built uh, 1950 to the late 80s, so over that 30-year period. Uh, our ports are actually still being built out, on, but if, as Mayor Foster said, if the, the infrastructure isn't there um, after it comes to the ports, then that's where we're going to have trouble. Uh, we see enormous increase coming. Um, turn this. Our highway miles have increased only 5% since the 1980s, and yet vehicle miles traveled have increased 97%. If you don't believe that, come to LA. Uh, our railroads actually decreased the mileage of tracks. We, uh, in the 1980s, were struggling financially and had to spin off some of the shorter uh, lines that weren't as productive. So we, I call us the arteries, and the highways are the capillaries, so to speak. So we really focused on key corridors that, that were able to move large volumes of freight. So we actually haul 70% more freight than, than we did um, when we had more track. Uh, we've done that through, of course, adding trains as part of it, but we've also increased the efficiency of those trains and the amount of cargo we can get on that train, double stacking and, and better utilizing the space in that train. What do we need? Uh, we need a freight plan. Absolutely, we need a freight plan. Um, we need to start preserving right-of-ways better than we have in the past. And again, LA as a megatropolis is, uh, <laughs> is a case study in not preserving right-of-ways. And that's something that as cities grow, we need to preserve those right-of-ways. Uh, we need more performance-based funding. Uh, Tiger, the Tiger program was a great program, and we're very supportive of that type of program that looks for projects that um, really can move more freight and, and based on a performance. And then we also need some regulatory reform. Let's face it, it's taking too long to get some of these projects built. We need to identify what those obstacles are and find ways to uh, move past those obstacles. At BNSF, um, we know that growth will, we're going to add 100 million people in the next three to four decades, and that will be largely in the megatropolis. Megatropol, I'm still not ready for that word. <laughs> um, um, so we are focusing our growth on those areas. Uh, growth for the railroads actually falls into four buckets, um, track and making sure that we have the track capacity that we need, making sure that we have the facilities we need at each end of that track to load and offload, and then also making sure we have the equipment that we need, rail equipment, locomotives, and the people that we need to move that. And we've had problems in all of those areas in the past. Um, from a track standpoint, uh, the Transcon, which is that, that line serving Southern California, uh, has been a major source of investment for us. Over $800 million in the past 10 years to double track that. So we have invested heavily and are invested heavily in Southern California, uh, continuing to, to serve imports and exports. Uh, the Cone Pass is uh, in Southern California. It's kind of the... Uh, for California, I'll refer to California <laughs> as a bowl. We live in a geographic bowl, but Cajon Pass is one of the mountain ranges that, that takes us out of that bowl, and that's actually pertinent because of all the air quality issues that you hear us talk about. Um, the prevailing winds are from the ocean side. They come in up against those mountains, and that is one of the reasons, not just population-based, but that is one of the reasons why California uh, has so many air quality issues, and I'm going to touch on that in just a moment. Um, but from a facility side, we've we built Memphis, uh, $200 million there. Kansas City, we're in the process of building a $250 million facility. And our Southern California International Gateway is a $500 million proposal. Uh, we have a $3.9 billion 2012 capital investment. And my last slide is uh, about our facility in Southern California. And I want to touch on this because uh, a lot of times people think we're the railroads of the past and, and we're not being innovative. And because of the air quality issues that I mentioned in, in Southern California, when we proposed to, to build this NERDOC facility in California, and, and the, most of the terminals have on-dock capacity, but they're not able to keep up. May, they may not have the destination volume that they need at that terminal. And to keep those flu fluid, we still need some off-dock 
facilities, and right now BNSF has to take our cargo 20 miles up the 710 freeway, so we thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Let's load it closer to the port and use the Alameda corridor. Um, but when we sat down to design this facility, we knew we were designing it from scratch. And f for air quality purposes, we thought, okay, we, the cranes need to be electric. And more and more, uh, we're using containers instead of trailers with wheels. We're using boxes like Legos, and we're able to stack those blocks boxes. So we designed this facility uniquely. And what, what we designed was to use a wide span crane and a stacking operation. If you were to look at a lot of our intermodal yards now, they are trailer on wheels and it's a big parking lot. And so you have to have a lot of acreage. Whereas in this facility, we'll actually be able to decrease that acreage, stack those containers, use electric wide span cranes. Um, our gates, getting trucks in and out, are automated, so there's far less time uh, at, the, at the gates. And this will be one of the green, this will be the greenest facility in the United States that will be built. So we're very proud of that investment. But, but we, when we proposed this, it was several years ago, we've since built these white span cranes in Seattle, and our Memphis facility was built with these cranes. And uh, we're very proud of this new technology that we've introduced. So with that, thank you. So now we'll open it up for a discussion for a few minutes. Comments? Uh, I'm Richard Wainey of the Port of Tampa. We work very closely with CSX. We also have a really nice uh, partnership going forward just like Jacksonville does. In fact, our on-dock unit train facility will be completed uh, by July of this year and we'll be able to bring 80 to 100 uh, cars in at a time with, uh, it's a multi-purpose yard. We'll be able to bring in ethanol from the Midwest, 80 cars at a time or more, uh, any kind of bulk materials. And, uh, and it also has an intermodal capability to handle unit trains of containers. So uh, things like that are going forward. You commented on that. And you know, when you start off your presentation and say, you know, the railroads were built 100 years ago and track trackage is 35% less or less now than it was, uh, you know, in past years. Uh, that kind of uh, ignores the fact that, as I understand it, collectively you and SP have been spending something like three or four billion dollars a year on average for the last five years. Your actual capacity now is probably far greater than it was uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago to move containers with all the innovations and the additions, the double tracking, the double stacking, fixing the tunnels, the ICTFs, and on and on and on. So, so it's not like you're standing still. Uh, we need to do more, but I, I assume that you do have a lot of capacity and you're adding more. I mentioned, as I mentioned, it's really the right of way. There's a limit to how much and we've maximized a lot of that um, over the years. The, the bi biggest growth was in the 2000s, and we were pretty much constrained at that point in 2006, 2007 with what we had there. Um, having said that, well, it, it's really going to be the megatropolis, th those areas where, like Los Angeles, we can only get two tracks in. And we don't have enough storage close to the port. It's just finding the land, and really as, as Planners, we need to start planning for where we're going to have logistics parks, where we're going to put these right-of-ways, what right-of-ways we're going to preserve for that because we're pretty much built out. Any other comments or questions before we break for this session? All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our press conference, but before that, uh, Tom uh, would like to uh, say a few final thoughts. Well, the press conference, uh, what will we be looking at? Dave, help me here, just for logistics. The press conference will be the next day. We will begin the press conference for Orlando. Orlando. Orlando, we can remember that. Um, you know, I, I think I, I just want to go back to a few years ago when President Obama was elected. Um, we, don't, we, we will never know what his first administration would have been like because of the meltdown we had. But we did a lot of work at that time 
before the, the economic meltdown with the leadership of, of Manny Diaz, our president. And it had to do with infrastructure. It had to do with water infrastructure, rail, this, everything we're talking about. Ports and all of this it has got to be put together for a new agenda. And uh, I know that uh, uh, you've heard Mayor Smith, who's, who's one of our incoming presidents. Mayor Nutter is not here from Philadelphia. Mayor Villagosa will be here tomorrow. And their vision is that um, a lot of people think, you know, the economy is coming back. They were encouraged by the, by the, by the lo lower rates of unemployment. But um, it, it'll be up to us, and this, will, this, will, this meeting, uh, uh, Chairman, gives us strength. And so uh, we have other allies, too, uh, from the private sector and what have you. And so we have to have an open conspiracy. When the President of the United States asks, and I, and I hope that uh, Mr. Romney or whoever it is will also be into building our own, rebuilding our own nation. I know that uh, this, this issue of uh, rebuilding our schools and bridges and roads and ports and what have you really resonates in the South and the Midwest and heartland and across the United States of America. So uh, we have a bipartisan, open conspiracy uh, coalition, a very political one, to raise the debate, raise the issues of the, of the presidential campaign as we go forward. And we're going to be in Orlando. And uh, you know, uh, that little strip of the world in Florida can decide where the next, next president's going to be. That's one of the reasons we're going to be down there. So we expect uh, Mayor Smith, uh, uh, who is of well, the Republican Party, just hosted the uh, debate. Uh, you know, I cannot be partisan, but we can be bipartisan. And that's what it's all about. Uh, trying to bring a bipartisan coalition to both candidates to, to lift the, the discussion uh, from where it is now. We, we've not, there have been 20 debates, 20 presidential debates, and I, it's not, this is not a partisan statement. I mean, we, we haven't heard too much about, quote, our stuff. You know, we, we've had one or two questions on housing, and you all know where it's been. So um, this is a, this is a uh, we're soaking it up, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and we're listening, the staff is listening, we're writing, and it all starts somewhere. And I think we will look back at Jacksonville and say, you remember what we said there? So this has been a great session in the morning, and we'll continue to work in the afternoon, and, and thank all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Let's give Tom a hand for his leadership. <laughs>